considering where he came from, you know, he was born uh, in a tenement in Glasgow. There was four children, two adults in a room and kitchen. Father died at 11, and he was sent off to relatives because the mother couldn't make it. And yet, you know, look where he ended up. Charles Charlie John Dempsey was born on the 4th of March 1921 in Carlton, Glasgow, Scotland, and died on the 24th of June 2008 in Auckland, New Zealand. He arrived in New Zealand on the 3rd of September 1952 with his wife Anne, Annie, and daughters Alice and Josephine after a seven and a half week journey on the Captain Hobson. While his early energies were focused on building and the establishment of the highly successful Dempsey Morton and Co Limited, he is best remembered for his contribution to football at club, provincial, national and international level, which ultimately led to a revered role at FIFA. At the time he cut back his involvement in the building industry, Dempsey said he devoted 70% of his time to football, 20% to golf, and 10% to business. Travelling halfway around the world to a new country was something he never regretted, saying, I have never been homesick for Scotland. Eastern suburbs as a club, then Auckland, New Zealand, Oceania and FIFA all benefited from the energies he poured into the game, which so rightly had him recognised as the father of Oceania soccer. In recognising Dempsey's various roles in football worldwide, we look back at his contributions at all levels. Club. While his early on-field involvement in Auckland was playing at the Mount Roskill, Ellerslie and Ponsonby clubs, Dempsey's link with eastern suburbs was the launching pad for a career unparalleled in New Zealand football. The Eastern Suburbs Association Football Club Inc. was formed in 1934 with the amalgamation of Tamaki United, affiliated in 1924, and Glen Innes, formed in 1930. It quickly became one of the biggest clubs in Auckland, attracting players from the eastern suburbs. Suburbs have won the Chatham Cup five times and been runners-up three times. Only three clubs have had greater success and won the second Rothmans National League in 1971 after being crowned Northern League champions in 1965 and 1966. While these victories brought great prestige and publicity to the club, its greatest success has been the provision of a recreational and sporting environment for thousands of youngsters and their families. The club has been able to do this because successive club committees have committed themselves to fostering the development of junior and youth soccer. First invited to join Eastern Suburbs by Dudley Rothall in 1959, initially to assist with the club's juniors and coach the 10th grade team, Dempsey soon stepped up to coach the senior side, following Billy Walsh's appointment as an Auckland selector. Dempsey immersed himself at Eastern Suburbs with his wife Annie by his side and pitching in to help out with menial tasks, including washing team gear. It was a happy relationship between a well-established club and a maverick Scott keen and determined to play a part in what had long been regarded as a successful club. For two and a half years, Dempsey was at the coaching helm, despite reservations by then North Shore United coach Ken Armstrong who in a newspaper article predicted Dempsey would fail in the role and the club would be relegated. Dempsey had other ideas. The team survived and not much later Dempsey, the innovator, took eastern suburbs on a short tour of New Caledonia, the first such venture by a New Zealand soccer club. They drew one and lost one on the two-match tour. Dempsey and Armstrong later continued their blossoming friendship on the soccer field where Dempsey turned out for the Corinthians and on the golf course where they were the keenest of rivals. Dempsey later extended his playing days by turning up at Golden Oldies tournaments, as determined as ever. Freed of his coaching duties at Eastern Suburbs when he was replaced in the role by Armstrong, the club benefited from Dempsey's enthusiasm and dedication when he was elected chairman and president, beating incumbent Andy Kyle and what became a 50-plus year off-field commitment to the sport he loved. As president of Eastern Suburbs, 
Dempsey revealed his entrepreneurial skills when, as part of the club's annual gala day, he organised an elephant race after coercing a visiting circus to lend him the animals. It did not find favour in some high places. Dempsey laughed it off and the next year quickly dismissed any suggestion he should parachute onto the ground. The tour to New Caledonia had other spin-offs, with the New Caledonian team invited to play against eastern suburbs in Auckland. Dempsey was then asked by New Zealand Football Association chairman Jim Kershaw to negotiate for a more extensive visit by the New Caledonians, which was undertaken very successfully in 1962. Dempsey was president at Eastern Suburbs from 1961 to 1964 and in 1966 was justly recognised with life membership of the club of which he was patron for many years. In honouring Charlie Dempsey with life membership of both the Auckland and New Zealand Football Associations, the game in New Zealand recognised the key roles he had played in the growth of the game on and off the field. He got things done. I mean, I think when Charlie had the dream of the World Cup, I think people thought he was stark raving mad. I mean, it'd been, we'd never been before when, when we went to that. And there were so many, you know, unusual ways of doing things. I mean, I remember people, you know, stuffing money in people's pockets when we played charity matches and we, so many unusual ways of raising money. But we got there in the end and uh, Charlie had his own way. I think he was one, one in a million, really. I mean, uh, without Charlie, they wouldn't have been a World Cup, that's for sure. Well, the crowning points were the all-white success in winning through to the 1982 World Cup in Spain and Dempsey's drive to get Oceania recognised as a fully-fledged member of FIFA. His boardroom contribution was all-encompassing. From the time he was elected to the chairmanship and presidency at Eastern Suburbs, Dempsey lived and breathed football. For 20 years, he was a member of the Auckland Football Association Control Board serving for eight years as deputy chairman and for 11 as chairman, a role which doubled as chairman of the Northern Provincial Council. He went on to become their long-serving president from 1992. Those two decades saw unprecedented growth in a sport regarded as a poor cousin in New Zealand's winter sporting landscape. Dempsey was in the thick of it as he coupled his involvement with the AFA and his 23-year stint as an NZFA council member. From 1982 to 1988, he was NZFA chairman and on stepping down from that role, took up the presidency of the national body. One of his greatest achievements was instigating the joint tours arrangement, a marriage of the two associations and a key part of the 1982 World Cup campaign. There were risks, mainly financial, and embarking on such an ambitious venture. But Dempsey was determined, and eventually that doggedness was rewarded when the All Whites beat China and Singapore in a sudden death match, which allocated the winner the 24th and last place in the World Cup, and the rewards which went with it. It was the culmination of years of hard work, often behind the scenes, by Dempsey and others. Never afraid to delegate, Dempsey surrounded himself with people he knew could make a difference, be it at local, national or international level. Charlie got me along to a, a number of football matches. The first one actually was when Manchester United played over here and Georgie Best, the old Marriman, was playing. Uh, he, I also, there was an Irish team out here. He got me along as consul to say a few words. And the way he was treated was, frankly, I w would have expected that because in his business, in his own company, he was treated with respect always. In 1967, the NZFA turned down the chance to bring Manchester United to New Zealand. Dempsey jumped at the opportunity, invited the Red Devils to play in Auckland and sat back in delight as the tour reaped a huge profit for the AFA, money which was used to build a grandstand at Newmarket Park. In his time at the boardroom table, Dempsey saw such innovations as the National League, a co competition like no other in New Zealand sport. Impressed by the ingeniousness of it, other codes soon followed suit. During that period, the Chatham Cup final, played for more than 40 years exclusively at Wellington's Basin Reserve, was taken on the road, 
giving fans around the country the chance to watch soccer's showpiece game. He also oversaw the introduction of sponsorship to the coveted knockout competition. Understanding the importance of coaching, good coaching, Dempsey pushed for the engagement of coaches he felt could make a difference. He threw his support behind Ken Armstrong, Lou Brosich, Juan Schwanner, Barry Truman, Wally Hughes, John Adshead, Kevin Fallon, Alan Jones, Doug Moore and many others as he stressed the role such people had to play in the evolution of the game in New Zealand. Oh, his absolute individuality and his ability to not change. Charlie was Charlie, whether he was beside the Queen or whether he was talking to a, a carpenter in the back of Fletcher's. Charlie was Charlie. While he was never one to seek the limelight, Dempsey, honoured with those life memberships in 1985, AFA, and 1988, NZFA, was even prouder when the Queen accorded him a CBE in 1982 for services to football in New Zealand and other Commonwealth countries. In 1990, he was awarded the Commemoration Medal for services to New Zealand by the New Zealand Government. People talk about the voters in uh, uh, the vote in about South Africa and Germany. You know, I uh, was part of that. I was the one taking the minutes. I was the one uh, communicating with the members. And what Charlie did, I think, had the full support of Oceania and all its members. And therefore, I think uh, the media out of context have, have blown the situation up. He had the full support of what he did. You know, and in hindsight, uh, it was a good thing. Blatt is quoted to say that, you know, he, he came up to Charlie in Australia and he said to Charlie, look, I'd like to thank you for what you did or didn't do because, because of you, we understood that in 2006 South Africa wasn't ready and therefore they needed a bit more time. And, and, and it was nice that the FIFA president, Sir Blatter, went up to Charlie and said these things to him. And, you know, and even South Africa thanked them in the end because they didn't needed those four years so what happened is that in 2006 we had a fantastic World Cup because Germany were ready. And in 2010 we had a better World Cup because it needed, South Africa needed that time to prepare itself. And they say that South Africa now, or in 2010, sorry, was one of the best FIFA World Cups that they've ever held. Somewhat bizarrely, the acknowledged father of the Oceania Football Confederation is perhaps best remembered not for all the good he achieved in taking football from the backwaters of the global game into the hallowed corridors of FIFA, but for something he did not do. Dempsey's abstention from the vote for the 2006 World Cup captured headlines worldwide and led to Germany being awarded hosting rights ahead of South Africa after the rejection of England, who had been the choice of the Oceania executive. Subsequent events justified Dempsey's stance. He insisted 2006 was too early for the Republic to host the world's greatest tournament. Sadly, he did not live long enough to see the 2010 World Cup, hosted superbly by South Africa. At the time, Dempsey said he had made that call for personal reasons, and by so doing had been able to continue his friendship with all FIFA confederations. The outcry which followed that infamous no vote led Dempsey to resign the presidency of the Oceania Football Confederation and subsequently to step down from FIFA, saying, my family has been harassed and I'm not prepared to let that continue. The pressure has been too much for me. My family is more important. Well, I just want to go back to what Charlie's done in Oceania. You know, um, I don't know if many people know this, but uh, when he went to the idea of FIFA for Oceania to be a confederation, uh, they almost laughed at him, yeah? So uh, what they said is, go to the islands and try and get us, uh, see what the membership looks like, what football looks like in the Pacific, and then trying to determine whether you can form a confederation. So that's what he did. I think he flew to every country. He met with all the, all, all, all the different football associations across the Pacific. And eventually, uh, starting with three, with Fiji, New Caledonia, Australia, New Zealand, sorry, four, uh, he, he would uh, pursue uh, in each country football and get it developed in, in, enough so that uh, he, we can form the Oceania Football Confederation. So the confederation was formed in 1964, um, 
And then obviously in 1996 uh, uh, in Zurich uh, was the time that FIFA finally recognised Oceania as a full confederation. Dempsey deservedly won far more bokehs than brickbats for his efforts in establishing and then overseeing the fledgling confederation of which he became the patriarch. First mooted during discussions at the time of the football tournament at the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games, the confederation was founded two years later, following inaugural discussions between then FIFA president, Sir Stanley Rouse, Jim Bayuti from the Australian Soccer Federation and New Zealand Football Association chairman, Sid Guppy. Shunned by the Asian Football Confederation, Australia and New Zealand went it alone in forming the Confederation and, along with Fiji and Papua New Guinea, were the foundation members. Dempsey was approached by the NZFA to be the representative and to work with Bayuti. In 1966, their efforts were rewarded when FIFA formally approved their proposal and the OFC came into being. Well, he's known as the father of Oceania, and, and, and I look now, and, and what he achieved in getting Oceania status is you know, something that New Zealand's enjoying today. You know, we are the predominant representative in all the FIFA tournaments. We've got free entry into the juniors. You know. This would not have happened without OFC as a, as a confederation. So to achieve that, and knowing the politics that go into all that, I mean, I, I'm just you know, full of admiration about you know, the fact that Oceania exists. We are the smallest confederation. Um, but we've got credibility and, um, you know, early on we probably didn't. Um, he managed that through and we're reaping the rewards now and we, and we have a big part to play in, in, in world football because of it. Dempsey remained the driving force and took real pride in his achievements in bringing together the nations of the Pacific. He always encouraged the smaller nations to play an active role in promoting football in the region, insisting those countries should be among the Confederation's office bearers. After years of co-opted status at FIFA, Dempsey's dream was finally realised in 1996 when the OFC was accorded full confederation status and handed a seat on the all-powerful FIFA Executive Committee. Dempsey continued to work tirelessly for Oceania and was the driving force behind efforts to establish a purpose-built academy which the confederation could call home. Originally planned to be named after FIFA president, Dr. Havelonge, Oceania member countries vetoed that suggestion and insisted the $1.2 million facility should be known as the Charles J. Dempsey Football Academy. To this day, it remains the OFC headquarters. Dempsey's contribution, drive and unflagging support in Oceania is without equal and is repaid every time an Oceania team wins through to play on the international stage. From the time Charlie Dempsey became involved in the establishment of the Oceania Football Confederation, he had his sights set much higher. It was, many would say, inevitable that Dempsey would one day take his seat around the executive table at FIFA headquarters. In those early days, that was anything but a given. FIFA did not make change for change's sake. There is, and was, no room for sentiment at the world's biggest, and sometimes ruthless, sporting organisation. There was, and remains, a protocol which had long been observed for the admission of new countries, or even more importantly, new confederations. Prepare to bide his time and do the hard yards necessary to achieve this end, Dempsey did it all right, and was eventually accepted and honoured by football's governing body. I, I don't think we quite knew back here what Charlie was doing with Oceania. It was, it was Charlie's baby, and Charlie used to go off and do these things with Oceania, and he nurtured this baby uh, for years and years and years, and quietly, uh, without us knowing really, or without us realizing, uh, he elevated the standing of the game in FIFA's eyes and got Oceania recognized as a world confederation. Uh, and with that came certain rights, which enabled us to move on, get coaching support, etc., etc. We're really seeing the benefit of all that now, more, more so than then. From 1966 until his retirement from the OFC in 2000, Dempsey served a variety of roles within FIFA. He was OFC General Secretary 
for 11 years from 1972, which brought him into constant touch with Zurich. In 1986, despite Dempsey's protestations, his daughter Josephine stepped into that role, with Dempsey then into his fourth year as OFC president, having even closer contact with FIFA. While OFC had no official status with FIFA at that time, since it was not a full member, Dempsey served on FIFA committees from 1985, and in 1994 he was a co-opted member of FIFA's all-powerful executive committee, eventually gaining full membership in 1996. From 1985 to 1998, Dempsey was a member of the World Youth Under-20 Championship Committee and was involved in the running of all such championships. In the same period, he served at six Under-17 World Championships, attended all eight World Cups from 1970 to 1998 in an official capacity, and was involved at the Olympic Tournament in Atlanta in 1996, the Confederation Cups in 1997 and 1999, and the 2000 Club World Championship in Brazil. As far back as 1988, the FIFA president paid tribute to the work Dempsey had done by saying, New Zealand, Oceania and FIFA owe an awful lot to Charles Dempsey. I am indeed glad to put on record my recognition of his outstanding service to football. Well, of course, uh, I came when Josephine was general secretary and Charlie was president. So I came in an opportune time and uh, I think, uh, you know, let history judge, but I think the work that uh, me as General Secretary and our President are doing now is all that we've learned uh, at the time when Charlie was President and Josephine was the General Secretary. I remember Alice was Head of Finance, so uh, you're right, the Dempsey family has paid their part in making Oceania what it is today. From 1968 until 1999, Dempsey clocked up thousands upon thousands of air miles as he attended every FIFA Congress or extra honorary Congress and FIFA stroke OFC consultative meetings. Perhaps his greatest recognition from the international body came in 2002 when he was accorded honorary membership of FIFA, just the 26th such recipient in 98 years. The honours continued when in 2004 he was awarded the FIFA Centennial Order of Merit but despite all the deserved accolades for his work around the boardroom table and in other roles at some of the world's greatest sporting tournaments, Charlie Dempsey remained a football fan who loved nothing more than taking a seat in the stand. That, surely, is how he would like to be remembered. Well, he was obviously larger than life and uh, we were all a bit fearful of him at the time, but uh, as you got to know him, he was all bluff and bluster and uh, you know, he had a heart of gold. Um, but the thing that I always rem um, you know, remember it is always known as Charlie and you know, to get a first name and everyone knows who you are, that's, that's pretty special. So the Brazilians did it, so did Charlie. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, a, a lifetime of dedication and um, he's certainly, a miss for me, he's a, a, a man who you miss anyway. He's a real character and there's not that many characters in the game these days and you, know, you need that kind of people, I think, in the game. Uh, I call him a mighty man, a mighty man. Thank you.